Hello guys, welcome back to Not Just Mecha, it's Marco here and today we talk about color schemes. The wrong scheme can turn even the best sculpt into an ugly model, while a good choice of use, their intensities and reciprocal behavior will make a little piece of plastic into an intense storytelling experience. We constantly discuss about the best colors for our models, but talking about color schemes as miniature painters, we often tend to oversimplify this reasoning, considering just the tip of the iceberg of a much wider topic. A color scheme is not only choosing a nice tone for a cape or an armor, but it's the heart and soul of a model, of the environment that surrounds the figure and the story they should convey. Doesn't matter if the miniature doesn't have a full diorama all around and it stands on a super simple little gaming base with just few square millimeters of visible ground. Every model lives in a virtual space that all of us have clearly in mind, and even most important, every model is frozen in a shot that's our duty to make interesting and dramatic. The study of color schemes, color composition and harmonies in classic painting, photography or even cinematography doesn't stop on the colors of the outfit worn by the character in the scene, but it involves the full scene, with all the elements contained inside that frame. So, choosing a color scheme has to be like directing the photography of a movie, because, again, it's not only about the costume of the character, but it has to convey the full general mood of the scene and its environmental light. In my work as painter's coach, I noticed that one of the biggest barriers, especially for beginners, is to break away from the commercial and standardized color schemes, and translate this kind of reasoning into a working choice of colors and a physical palette. And often, even more experienced painters have an hard time trying to connect a specific scheme to the big picture, fusing everything with environmental light and mood. With this series, I want to help you understand and use in a practical way the full potential of this enhanced point of view, painting in every episode the same model in three different ways, showing the full mental planning and the highlights of the painting process. Obviously, the variety of potential looks and styles is almost infinite, so I'll need your help to choose the themes for the next models. So let me know in the comments what you want to see in the next episodes. After a long pause, I recently came back to Dungeons and Dragons, and the models are heavily inspired to the illustrations in the player's manuals explaining the alignments. I used color schemes and environmental lights to create not only three different looks, but also three different moods that, like symbolic artworks, try to deliver a bit of the soul of the characters. We have the young, uncompromising lawful good paladin inside a cold holy light from above. A more experienced, disenchanted neutral duelist in a fiery scene between two warm light sources and a cold-blooded evil assassin inside a creepy green magical light coming from below. This time I used only inks, contrast paints and standard brushwork to make everything easier to follow, and more focused on the planning phase. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell button to always know what happens on the channel! I chose a cool model with a balanced amount of different elements that I can use to convey the different schemes and styles, and I think it's the first girl I paint for the channel. Thanks to the magic of 3D printing, it's super easy and cheap to do this kind of exercises and experiments on high quality models. You can work on the same plastic trooper, but painting a character like this one is for sure more satisfying and keeps the inspiration to higher levels. You can find the link to this incredible miniature by Archvillain Games in the description. I thought to use 3D printed models for this series because it's extremely easy to get trapped in branded existing backgrounds and color schemes, and everyone has precise expectations about how every specific Space Marine chapter should look like, for example. Using this kind of models, we can all be unbiased and a little more free. Check these beauties. I find the whole 3D printing process extremely simple, and after every print I have a better understanding of the little nuances of the various steps. A friend is helping me getting a better grasp of the supports. Thanks to a lifetime into the hobby, I have a precise idea about where to put the supports, but making them this thin and easy to remove is the final frontier. I'll share some tips as soon as I'll be more confident about the reliability of my process. 
I learned to remove the supports before curing the models, to be able to work with a softer and more forgiving resin. This helped a lot to obtain a better finish where the support meets the figure. This step is extremely simple for any modeler used to work with sprues and fight against gaps and seam lines, but I discovered a trick that makes the process even easier. I bragged about being an expert modeler, but I didn't make a simple connection. This is resin! And even if a bit less elastic than the classic resin used for miniatures, it still behaves in the same way and it's sensible to heat. Putting the model in hot water is enough to weaken thin elements like the supports, and they come off simply touching them. Be careful working on thin or little proud elements of the sculpt because they will be affected in the same way. The models are ready for painting and we can finally discuss the plan for the first one, the Paladin. Before starting I suggest you to check the video up here if you need a basic overview of the most common color harmonies and their logic. This is the first model of the first episode, so I want to start with something extremely basic and simple. I always start with a story, that helps me defining who the character is and where and when the scene is taking place. I want to represent a young paladin still in training in her temple. I want to show the adamantine purity of her belief and her uncompromising nature with the general cold atmosphere and unheavenly diffused cold light coming directly from above. Basically I use the story to figure out direction, intensity and temperature of my main light. Knowing these details I can move to the outfit, aka the color scheme of the model itself. I don't want to overcomplicate this paint job, so I'm going to use an equidistant triad, a simple triadic scheme that always generates an eye-catching result. I want to support and enhance the cold mood I have in mind, using a light blue as general tone for our clothes. This will be the dominant color of the scheme, so the hue covering the larger surfaces of the model, and the one leaving the vague general impression of the figure. At this point I can choose the secondary tone or the ascent. I know for sure that I want her to be a glacial blonde, so this will be my powerful ascent. The secondary tone is meant to complement and support the others, maintaining a certain level of contrast, but without taking too much attention. Following the rules of this harmony, I'll use a warm brown for the equipment. Using a warm brown instead of a more striking warm tone, I'm sure it will not steal too much attention from the other parts. I start the work with a black and white sketch of the main light and the volumes it generates. This will be a strong zenithal light, perpendicular to the ground and with a good amount of diffusion all around. This kind of light is usually considered a basic wargaming light, but you can use it also for more advanced looks if you are coherent with your vision. With the airbrush I quickly fix a basic transparent skin tone over the sketch, using Daleroni flash tint. You can easily use contrast paints with brush or airbrush for these preparatory steps. And turquoise to fix the general tones of her clothes. I try to avoid the upper parts to create a modulation from white and create, maintaining the extreme values of the sketch, a powerful highlight. I simply use this contrast yellow for her saturated blonde hair. I'm still not sure about how much warm brown I want to see on the model, so I start base coating the metal parts. A mix of Vallejo metal color dura aluminium and scale 75 trash metal is my secret weapon for a quick general coat of light silver that later can be easily adapted and transformed in any other possible metallic tone. At this point I feel confident to introduce the secondary brown elements using contrast griffon orange. As all the other transparent tones, it creates a nice modulation working on the initial value sketch. My basic scheme is in place, but I want to fix some tones in all the missing parts before adding complexity to what I already have. I use a wet blend of three contrast paints to create a dirty greenish grey for the base. 
I used just a touch of Plague Bearer Flash to give the sensation of moss and fine vegetation between the light grey bricks. Thanks to this uh, preparatory work, now I have a better general sensation of the model, and I can add other focal points. I use yellow ink to filter the light silver, creating a metallic version of the effect made by the air in the logic of the skin. Before moving to the wet palette and the brush work, I add few shadows with the airbrush, more to speed up my work in the next stage than anything else. I use few transparent layers of bar amber on the leather equipment and the skin. This is a neutral choice in terms of tones, more to fix a solid mid-tone than a proper shadow. I use blue with the same logic on her clothes, and I touch here and there the silver armor with extremely light filters, better call them a fine overspray, to give it the bluish feel of a clean steel. To break the absolute coldness of the scheme and to introduce a powerful contrast between lights and shadows, I use pure violet. Thanks to the light, transparent layers used until this point, the original volume sketch is still easily visible, and I use it as a map to place violet in the extreme shadows. The whole scene is based on the strength of the main cold light from above, and a relatively warm dark tone in the shadows will push the tonal and value contrast to maximum levels, balancing at the same time the whole scheme. To the wet palette, boy wonder! I prepared on the palette the full range of chimera colors. I don't need them all for this model, but in real life I did this step for the three models at the same time, and I used more or less every single color. The brushwork is very straightforward. It's all about refining what I already have in place and adding definition, working mostly on extreme lights and shadows. I spent most of my time working on her face, trying to fix a severe and strict expression. The shape of mouth and eyebrows are the key to create a human expression, and since 99% of the times eyebrows are not sculpted on miniatures, we have a lot of freedom in this area. The most interesting part, and what really makes the difference in maintaining the coherency of the scheme and my mental vision of a cold general light, is that uh, painting the highlights, even the ones of the blonde hair and the warm leather, I used colder and colder tones. Adding a tiny pinch of blue in the mix for the highlights of the yellow hair, I had a cold sensation inside the warmer part of the scheme, tying everything together under the illusion of a common light. I do something similar working on the leather, using white to introduce a strong desaturation, and a pinch of green to make everything just a bit colder. This will create the illusion of a warm general tone exposed to a cold light. I plan to push a bit more on the warrior. In the Paladin I used a classic balance scheme, enhanced by a cold, not too invasive general light. Here I want to paint a passionate fighter, using an unbalanced scheme completely inside the warm spectrum, to deliver the flaming soul of this fiery warrior. For this purpose I plan to use an analogous color scheme, where the colors used are all closely related on the color wheel. Basically, I'm choosing to play only with the slice of the wheel, using only tones contained in the spectrum between yellow and magenta. If you don't consider all the neutral tones like black, white and silver, you'll notice that everything else comes from this side of the wheel. To stress even more this concept, I'll put the model between two warm lights, one a bit more neutral and one extremely warm, like she's giving her back to an explosion or a massive fire. Everything will arrive to your eyes coming from a yellowish warm filter, like a Conan movie or an episode of CSI Miami. <laughs> Again, you have the freedom to put this same outfit in a cold environment, like on a mountain in the middle of a snowstorm, putting the accent on the contrast between warm and cold, but here I want to express a precise extreme concept that's all about passion, rage and fire.
First, I fix the value sketch in black and white. Again, this is probably the most important part of my process, where I set intensity and direction of the main lights. I have a mild diffused light on one side and a stronger, more focused light source from the other one, with a dark terminator between them. From a technical point of view, this paint job will be even simpler than the first one. I use the transparency of contrast paints to fix the main tones of the scheme. Again, I want to put the focus of this video on schemes and lights, not on the single brush strokes. Doesn't really matter what kind of paints, tools or even steps you use, if you have a good plan and a solid mental image of your objective. Here I started with red hair, but I changed my mind in the middle of the process because with all the other red parts the focal point of the head wasn't really catching any attention. Even working with the best plan in mind you have to maintain the elasticity to change something that doesn't really work as imagined. The only cool tone used here is a drop of turquoise inside the black, used to prime again hair and the stripes of the outfit. The yellowish tone of the base comes from a wet blend of snakebite leather and plague bitter flesh. I really love to use this sick color on my bases. Again, I use the airbrush only to save some time and add a smooth neutral shadow on the skin. More a darker mid tone than a proper shadow. And to add a warm filter to the side facing the imaginary fire. This model has three extremely interesting main views, but this side is visually pretty weak, and this is a great trick to add extra visual interest to the weaker view of your models. Time for the wet palette! Again, I invested the best part of this phase working on her face. The objective is to create a different expression and the general illusion that uh, this is another woman, even if the sculpt is the same. The main light hits the face of this model frontally, creating less shadows on the cheeks, making the face immediately larger and softer. Contouring is a science, and if you want to paint realistic girls, you have to study the secrets of makeup. Women are doing this stuff since the dawn of civilization, we didn't invent anything, so ask your girlfriends for painting lessons. Slightly larger lips, a little curve in one side, eyebrows painted with a different angle and a different makeup, and she's a totally different person. Her highlights are painted using a base of chromatic black, made with an unbalanced mix of orange and thalo blue red shade, to express a bit more of its uh, warm note. Check the video up here to know more about this topic. The red parts are highlighted adding orange and then yellow to the red. Even with its powerful saturation, red is extremely influenced by the environmental light. Usually this is not the best technique to highlight a red, but inside this warm light it becomes the perfect way to do it. I use Scale 75 Artist Intense Yellow and Naples Yellow with the Chimera Tones to expand the variety of the numerous yellow shades all around the model. The 
This is a very interesting step. Like I did working with the cold note on the blonde hair, I'm glazing orange and yellow tones on the white parts to tie the relatively cold presence and neutral tone with a warm scene. She's almost ready. I need only to add strong, fiery reflections on the side exposed to the secondary light. We'll see them better working on the last model. With the assassin I want to make something extreme. In the paladin the scheme is the dominant part of the model and the environmental light just give it a kick. In the mercenary scheme and light work together with the same intensity to complete the picture. Here I want the light to do all the work. I imagined a demonic ritual in an underground cave filled with an unnatural, creepy and toxic green light coming from the strange candles on the floor. A deadly assassin is walking through this light ready to strike. To render this mood inspired by artworks and illustrations I'll use a complementary scheme in its most extreme form, opposing green lights to purple shadows. Black and white sketch. This time a genital light trying to aim from the candles. I want this to be almost the exact opposite effect I painted on the paladin. I paint in simple metallic silver all the metal parts. I want them to have their own finish, even inside the general glow. Then I simply tint all the white parts with yellow. This will boost the vibrancy and saturation of the next step, adding also extra tonal variety. and a filter of tallow green yellow shade. Here I start building a bit of modulation, giving just a light coat in the lower parts, more exposed to the light, and heavier coats where the light fades into the shadows. And I close this super simple airbrush stage, spraying pure magenta in the shadows. The effect is already cool and it's very powerful for gaming models that are in constant movement on the table. The best way to enjoy this kind of effects is precisely to move the model in all the possible directions. For the brush work I add to the palette two tones from the scale 75 artist range. This green is light and vibrant and it will make me save some time while mixing. And this magenta is perfect for the highlights in the shadows. Yep, even shadows have their own highlights. The idea here is to paint the light itself, with its fluid movements and living reflections. I start catching the edges and I keep adding brush strokes, lines and dots following the shapes of the model. I constantly change the pressure on the brush to make the lines more unpredictable. A great reference for this kind of effects are comic books, especially the covers. The idea for this one came from a Green Lantern volume. I add more color, thicker reflections and higher values to the parts closer to the light and more reflective in general.
and I apply a softer, smoother and more delicate version of this process in the shadows using violet and magenta. And here is the final result. As always, I tried to put too much in a single video, but again, this is the first episode of a new series and I have to tease your curiosity. It takes a lot of practice to transfer these concepts from the mind to the hands, but I really think that uh, these kind of examples can help you to metabolize in a quicker way the infinite potential of these combinations. I know that a lot of painters are here to get easy answers and a simple mathematical way to create the perfect scheme, but easy answers are not usually the best kind of answers. You can simplify this process to its lowest common denominator, but the final product will be affected consequently. My best suggestion is to study existing art, any kind of art and medium, and understand why it works and why it makes you feel in a certain way, retroengineering the result. And of course, ask me to paint your own thematic trio of models for the next video. If you like this video, give it a like and subscribe. Remember that you can ask me anything down below with the comment and you can follow my projects during the week using one of my socials. And if you want to support the channel and my work, check my Patreon page and join the community or maybe ask for a commission. See you next week, guys.